Israel by Herman Melville Audiobook 10x13 Descrying the five cruisers sailing down, the forty sail, like forty chickens, flu fluttered in a panic under the wing of the shore. Their armed protectors bravely steered from the land, making the disposition for battle. Promptly accepting the challenge, Paul, giving the signal to his consorts, earnestly pressed forward. But, earnest as he was, it was seven in the evening ere the encounter began. Meantime his comrades, heedless of his signals, sailed independently along. Dismissing them from present consideration, we confine ourselves, for a while, to the Richard and the Serapis, the grand duelists of the fight. The Richard carried a motley, crew, to keep whom in order 135 soldiers. Themselves a hybrid band. Had been put on board, commanded by French officers of inferior rank. Her armament was similarly heterogeneous, guns of all sorts and calibers, but about equal on the whole to those of a 32-gun frigate. The spirit of baneful intermixture pervaded this craft throughout. The Serapis was a frigate of 50 guns, more than half of which individually exceeded in caliber any one gun of the Richard. She had a crew of some 320 trained man of war's men. There is something in a naval engagement which radically distinguishes it from one on the land. The ocean, at times, has what is called its sea and its trough of the sea, but it has neither rivers, woods, banks, towns, nor mountains. In mild weather it is one hammered plain. Stratagems, like those of disciplined armies. Ambuscades, like those of Indians, are impossible. All is clear, open, fluent. The very element which sustains the combatants, yields at the stroke of a feather. One wind and one tide at one time operate upon all who here engage. This simplicity renders a battle between two men of war, with their huge white wings, more akin to the Miltonic contests of archangels than to the comparatively squalid tussles of earth. As the ships neared, a hazy darkness overspread the water. The moon was not yet risen. Objects were perceived with difficulty. Borne by a soft moist breeze over gentle waves, they came within pistol shot. Owing to the obscurity, and the known neighborhood of other vessels, the Serapis was uncertain who the Richard was. Through the dim mist each ship loomed forth to the other vast, but indistinct, as the ghost of Morven. Sounds of the trampling of resolute men echoed from either hull, whose tight decks dully resounded like drumheads in a funeral march. The Serapis hailed. She was answered by a broadside. For half an hour the combatants deliberately maneuvered, continually changing their position, but always within shot fire. They. Serapis. The better sailor of the two. Kept critically circling the Richard, making lounging advances now and then, and as suddenly steering off, hate causing her to act not unlike a wheeling cock about a hen when stirred by the contrary passion. Meantime, though within easy speaking distance, no further syllable was exchanged, but an incessant cannonade was kept up. At this point, a third party, the Scarborough, drew near, seemingly desirous of giving assistance to her consort. But thick smoke was now added to the night's natural obscurity. The Scarborough imperfectly discerned two ships, and plainly saw the common fire they made, but which was which, she could not tell. Eager to befriend the Serapis, she durst not fire a gun, lest she might unwittingly act the part of a foe. As when a hawk and a crow are clawing and beaking high in the air, a second crow flying near, will seek to join the battle, but finding no fair chance to engage, at last flies away to the woods, just so did the Scarborough now. Prudence dictated the step, because several chance shot, from which of the combatants could not be known, had already struck the Scarborough. So, unwilling uselessly to expose herself, off went for the present this baffled and ineffectual friend. Not long after, 
an invisible hand came and set down a great yellow lamp in the east. The hand reached up unseen from below the horizon, and set the lamp down right on the rim of the horizon, as on a threshold, as much as to say, Gentlemen warriors, permit me a little to light up this rather gloomy-looking subject. The lamp was the round harvest moon, the one solitary footlight of the scene. But scarcely did the rays from the lamp pierce that languid haze. Objects before perceived with difficulty, now glimmered ambiguously. Bedded in strange vapors, the great footlight cast a dubious, half-demoniac glare across the waters, like the phantasmagoric stream sent athwart a London flagging in a night rain from an apothecary's blue and green window. Through this sardonical mist, the face of the man in the moon. Looking right towards the combatants, as if he were standing in a trap door of the sea, leaning forward leisurely with his arms complacently folded over upon the edge of the horizon. This queer face wore a serious, apishly self-satisfied leer, as if the man in the moon had somehow secretly put up the ships to their contest, and in the depths of his malignant old soul was not unpleased to see how well his charms worked. There stood the grinning man in the moon, his head just dodging into view over the rim of the sea. Mephistopheles prompter of the stage. Aided now a little by the planet, one of the consorts of the Richard, the palace, hovering far outside the fight, dimly discerned the suspicious form of a lonely vessel unknown to her. She resolved to engage it, if it proved a foe. But ere they joined, the unknown ship, which proved to be the Scarborough, received a broadside at long guns distance from another consort of the Richard the Alliance. The shot whizzed across the broad interval like shuttlecocks across a great hall. Presently the battledores of both batteries were at work, and rapid compliments of shuttlecocks were very promptly exchanged. The adverse consorts of the two main belligerents fought with all the rage of those fiery seconds who in some desperate duels make their principles quarrel their own. Diverted from the Richard and the Serapis by this little by-play, the man in Themoon, all eager to see what it was, somewhat raised himself from his trap door with an added grin on his face. By this time, off sneaked the alliance, and down swept the palace, at close quarters engaging the Scarborough, an encounter destined in less than an hour to end in the latter ship's striking her flag. Compared to the Serapis and the Richard, the palace and the Scarborough were as two pages to two knights. In their immature way they showed the same traits as their fully developed superiors. The man in the moon now raised himself still higher to obtain a better view of affairs. But the man in the moon was not the only spectator. From the high cliffs of the shore, and especially from the great promontory of Flamborough Head, the scene was witnessed by crowds of the Icelanders. Any rustic might be pardoned his curiosity in view of the spectacle, presented. Far in the indistinct distance fleets of frightened merchantmen filled the lower air with their sails, as flakes of snow in a snowstorm by night. Hovering undeterminedly, in another direction, were several of the scattered consorts of Paul, taking no part in the fray. Nearer, was an isolated mist, investing the palace and Scarborough. A mist slowly adrift on the sea, like a floating isle, and at intervals irradiated with sparkles of fire and resonant with the boom of cannon. Further away, in the deeper water, was a lurid cloud, incessantly torn in shreds of lightning, then fusing together again, once more to be rent. As yet this lurid cloud was neither stationary nor slowly adrift, like the first mentioned one, but, instinct with chaotic vitality, shifted hither and thither, foaming with fire, like a valiant waterspout careering off the coast of Malabar. To get some idea of the events enacting in that cloud, it will be necessary to enter it, to go and possess it as a ghost may rush into a body, or the devils into the swine, which running down the steep place perished in the sea, just as the Richard is yet to do. Thus far the Serapis and the Richard had been maneuvering and chasing to each other like partners in a cotillion, all the time indulging in rapid repartee. 
but finding at last that the superior manageableness of the enemy's ship enabled him to get the better of the clumsy old India Amon, the Richard, in taking position, Paul, with his wanted resolution, at once sought to neutralize this, by hugging him close. But the attempt to lay the Richard right across the head of the Serapis ended quite otherwise, in sending the enemy's jib boom just over the Richard's great tower of Pisa, where Israel was stationed, who, catching it eagerly, stood for an instant holding to the slack of the sail, like one grasping a horse by the mane prior to vaulting into the saddle. I, hold hard, lad, cried Paul, springing to his side with a coil of rigging. With a few rapid turns he knitted himself to his foe. The wind now acting on the sails of the Serapis forced her, heel and point, her entire length, cheek by jowl, alongside the Richard. The projecting cannon scraped, the yards interlocked, but the hulls did not touch. A long lane of darkling water lay wedged between, like that narrow canal in Venice which dozes between two shadowy piles and high in air is secretly crossed by the bridge of size. But where the six yard arms reciprocally arched overhead, three bridges of size were both seen and heard, as the moon and wind kept rising. Into that Lethean canal. Pond like in its smoothness as compared with the sea without. Fell many a poor soul that night, fell, forever forgotten. As some heaving rent coinciding with a disputed frontier on a volcanic plain, that boundary abyss was the jaws of death to both sides. So contracted was it, that in many cases the gun rammers had to be thrust into the opposite ports, in order to enter to muzzles of their own cannon. It seemed more an intestine feud, than a fight between strangers. Or, rather, it was as if the Siamese twins, oblivious of their fraternal bond, should rage an unnatural fight. Ere long, a horrible explosion was heard, drowning for the instant the cannonade. Two of the old eighteen-pounders, before spoken of, as having been hurriedly set up below the main deck of the Richard, burst all to pieces, killing the sailors who worked them, and shattering all that part of the hull, as if two exploded steam boilers had shot out of its opposite sides. The effect was like the fall of the walls of a house. Little now upheld the great tower of Pisa but a few naked crow stanchions. Thenceforth, not a few balls from the Serapis must have passed straight through the Richard without grazing her. It was like firing buckshot through the ribs of a skeleton. But, further forward, so deadly was the broadside from the heavy batteries of the Serapis. Leveled point blank, and right down the throat and bowels, as it were, of the Richard that it cleared everything before it. The men on the Richard's covered gun deck ran above, like miners from the fire damp. Collecting on the forecastle, they continued to fight with grenades and muskets. The soldiers also were in the lofty tops, whence they kept up incessant volleys, cascading their fire down as pouring lava from cliffs. The position of the men in the two ships was now exactly reversed. For while the Serapis was tearing the Richard all to pieces below deck, and had swept that covered part almost of the last man, the Richard's crowd of musketry had complete control of the upper deck of the Serapis, where it was almost impossible for man to remain unless as a corpse. Though in the beginning, the tops of the Serapis had not been unsupplied with marksmen, yet they had long since been cleared by the overmastering musketry of the Richard. Several with leg or arm broken by a ball, had been seen going dimly downward from their giddy perch, like falling pigeons shot on the wing. As busy swallows about barneves and ridgepoles, some of the Richard's marksmen, quitting their tops, now went far out on their yard arms, where they overhung the Serapis. From thence they dropped hand grenades upon her decks, like apples, which growing in one field fall over the fence into another. Others of their band flung the same sour fruit into the open ports of the Serapis. A hailstorm of aerial combustion descended and slanted on the Serapis, while horizontal thunderbolts rolled crosswise through the subterranean vaults of the Richard. 
The belligerents were no longer, in the ordinary sense of things, an English ship and an American ship. It was a CO partnership and joint stock combustion company of both ships, yet divided, even in participation. The two vessels were as two houses, through whose party wall doors have been cut, one family, the Guelphs, occupying the whole lower story, another family, the Ghibellines, the whole upper story. Meanwhile, determined Paul flew hither and thither like the meteoric corpus ant ball, which shiftingly dances on the tips and verges of ships rigging in storms. Wherever he went, he seemed to cast a pale light on all faces. Blacked and burnt, his scotch bonnet was compressed to a gun wad on his head. His Parisian coat, with its gold-laced sleeve laid aside, disclosed to the full the blue tattooing on his arm, which sometimes in fierce gestures streamed in the haze of the cannonade, cabalistically terrific as the charmed standard of Satan. Yet his frenzied manner was less a testimony of his internal commotion than intended to inspirit and madden his men, some of whom seeing him, in transports of intrepidity stripped themselves to their trousers, exposing their naked bodies to the as naked shot the same was done on the Serapis, where several guns were seen surrounded by their buff crews as by fawns and satyrs. At the beginning of the fray, before the ships interlocked, in the intervals of smoke which swept over the ships as mist over mountain tops, affording open rents here and there. The gun deck of the Serapis, at certain points, showed, congealed for the instant in all attitudes of dauntlessness, a gallery of marble statues. Fighting gladiators. Stooping low and intent, with one braced leg thrust behind, and one arm thrust forward, curling round towards the muzzle of the gun, there was seen the loader, performing his allotted part, on the other side of the carriage, in the same stooping posture, but with both hands holding his long black pole, pike-wise, ready for instant use. Stood the eager rammer and sponger, while at the breach, crouched the wary captain of the gun, his keen eye, like the watching leopards, burning along the range, and behind all, tall and erect, the Egyptian symbol of death, stood the matchman, immovable for the moment, his long-handled match reversed. Up to their two long death-dealing batteries, the trained men of the Serapis stood and toiled in mechanical magic of discipline. They tended those rows of guns, as Lowell girls the rows of looms in a cotton factory. The Parsi were not more methodical, Atropus not more fatal, the automaton chess player not more irresponsible. Look, lad, I want a grenade, now, thrown down their main hatchway. I saw long piles of cartridges there. The powder monkeys have brought them up faster than they can be used. Take a bucket of combustibles, and let's hear from you presently. These words were spoken by Paul to Israel. Israel did as ordered. In a few minutes, bucket in hand, begrimed with powder, sixty feet in air, he hung like a pollyon from the extreme tip of the yard over the faded abyss of the hatchway. As he looked down between the eddies of smoke into that slaughterous pit, it was like looking from the verge of a cataract down into the yeasty pool at its base. Watching, his chance, he dropped one grenade with such faultless precision, that, striking its mark, an explosion rent the Serapis like a volcano. The long row of heaped cartridges was ignited. The fire ran horizontally, like an express on a railway. More than twenty men were instantly killed. Nearly forty wounded. This blow restored the chances of battle, before in favor of the Serapis. But the drooping spirits of the English were suddenly revived, by an event which crowned the scene by an act on the part of one of the consorts of the Richard, the incredible atrocity of which has induced all humane minds to impute it rather to some incomprehensible mistake than to the malignant madness of the perpetrator. The cautious approach and retreat of a consort of the Serapis, the Scarborough, before the moon rose, has already been mentioned. It is now to be related how that, when the moon was more than an hour high, a consort of the Richard, the Alliance, likewise approached and retreated. 
This ship, commanded by a Frenchman, infamous in his own navy, and obnoxious in the service to which he at present belonged, this ship, foremost in insurgency to Paul hitherto, and which, for the most part, had crept like a poltroon from the fray, the alliance now was at hand. Seeing her, Paul deemed the battle at an end. But to his horror, the alliance threw a broadside full into the stern of the Richard, without touching the Serapis. Paul called to her, for God's sake to forbear destroying the Richard. The reply was, a second, a third, a fourth broadside, striking the Richard ahead, astern, and amidships. One of the volleys killed several men and one officer. Meantime, like carpenters' augers, and the sea worm called Remora, the guns of the Serapis were drilling away at the same doomed hull. After performing her nameless exploit, the Alliance sailed away, and did no more. She was like the Great Fire of London, breaking out on the heel of the Great Plague. By this time, the Richard had so many shot holes low down in her hull, that like a sieve she began to settle. Do you strike? cried the English captain. I have not yet begun to fight, howled sinking Paul. This summons and response were whirled on eddies of smoke and flame. Both vessels were now on fire. The men of either knew hardly which to do, strive to destroy the enemy, or save themselves. In the midst of this, one hundred human beings, hitherto invisible strangers, were suddenly added to the rest. Five score English prisoners, till now confined in the Richard's hold, liberated in his consternation by the master at arms, burst up the hatchways. One of them, the captain of a letter of Mark, captured by Paul, off the Scottish coast, crawled through a port, as a burglar through a window, from the one ship to the other, and reported affairs to the English captain. While Paul and his lieutenants were confronting these prisoners, the gunner, running up from below, and not perceiving his official superiors, and deeming them dead, believing himself now left sole surviving officer, ran to the Tower of Pisa to haul down the colours. But they were already shot down and trailing in the water astern, like a sailor's towing shirt. Seeing the gunner there, groping about in the smoke, Israel asked what he wanted. At this moment the gunner, rushing to the rail, shouted quarter. Quarter. To the Serapis. I'll quarter yet, yelled Israel, smiting the gunner with the flat of his cutlass. Do you strike? Now came from the Serapis. I, I, I. Involuntarily cried Israel, fetching the gunner a shower of blows. Do you strike? again was repeated from the Serapis, whose captain, judging from the augmented confusion on board the Richard, owing to the escape of the prisoners, and also influenced by the report made to him by his late guest of the port hole, doubted not that the enemy must needs be about surrendering. Do you strike? I. I strike back roared Paul, for the first time now hearing the summons. But judging this frantic response to come, like the others, from some unauthorized source, the English captain directed his boarders to be called, some of whom presently leaped on the Richard's rail, but, throwing out his tattooed arm at them, with a sabre at the end of it, Paul showed them how boarders repelled boarders. The English retreated, but not before they had been thinned out again, like spring radishes, by the unfaltering fire from the Richard's tops. An officer of the Richard, seeing the mass of prisoners delirious with sudden liberty and fright, pricked them with his sword to the pumps, thus keeping the ship afloat by the very blunder which had promised to have been fatal. The vessels now blazed so in the rigging that both parties desisted from hostilities to subdue the common foe. When some faint order was again restored upon the Richard her chances of victory increased, while those of the English, driven under cover, proportionably waned. Early in the contest, Paul, with his own hand, had brought one of his largest guns to bear against the enemy's mainmast. That shot had hit. 
The mast now plainly tottered. Nevertheless, it seemed as if, in this fight, neither party could be victor. Mutual obliteration from the face of the waters seemed the only natural sequel to hostilities like these. It is, therefore, honor to him as a man, and not reproach to him as an officer, that, to stay such carnage, Captain Pearson, of the Serapis, with his own hands hauled down his colors. But just as an officer from the Richards swung himself on board the Serapis, and accosted the English captain, the first lieutenant of the Serapis came up from below inquiring whether the Richard had struck, since her fire had ceased. So equal was the conflict that, even after the surrender, it could be, and was, a question to one of the warriors engaged, who had not happened to see the English flag hauled down, whether the Serapis had struck to the Richard, or the Richard to the Serapis. Nay, while the Richard's officer was still amicably conversing with the English captain, a midshipman of the Richard, in act of following his superior on board the surrendered vessel, was run through the thigh by a pike in the hand of an ignorant boarder of the Serapis. While, Equally ignorant, the cannons below deck were still thundering away at the nominal conqueror from the batteries of the nominally conquered ship. But though the Serapis had submitted, there were two misanthropical foes on board the Richard which would not so easily succumb. Fire and Water All night the victors were engaged in suppressing the flames. Not until daylight were the flames got under, but though the pumps were kept continually going, the water in the hold still gained. A few hours after sunrise the Richard was deserted for the Serapis and the other vessels of the squadron of Paul. About ten o'clock the Richard, gorged with slaughter, wallowed heavily, gave a long roll, and blasted by tornadoes of sulfur, slowly sunk, like Gamara, out of sight. The loss of life in the two ships was about equal one half of the total number of those engaged being either killed or wounded. In view of this battle one may ask. What separates the enlightened man from the savage? Is civilization a thing distinct, or is it an advanced stage of barbarism? Chapter XX The Shuttle For a time back, across the otherwise blue-jean career of Israel, Paul Jones flits and reflits like a crimson thread. One more brief intermingling of it, and to the plain old homespun we return. The battle won, the squadron started for the Texel, where they arrived in safety. Omitting all mention of intervening harassments, suffice it, that after some months of inaction as to anything of a warlike nature, Paul and Israel, both, from different motives, eager to return to America, sailed for that country in the armed ship Ariel. Paul as commander, Israel as quartermaster. Two weeks out, they encountered by night a frigate-like craft, supposed to be an enemy. The vessels came within hail, both showing English colors, with purposes of mutual deception, affecting to belong to the English navy. For an hour, through their speaking trumpets, the captains equivocally conversed. A very reserved, adroit, hoodwinking, statesmanlike conversation, indeed. At last, professing some little incredulity as to the truthfulness of the stranger's statement, Paul intimated a desire that he should put out a boat and come on board to show his commission, to which the stranger very affably replied, that unfortunately his boat was exceedingly leaky. With equal politeness, Paul begged him to consider the danger attending a refusal, which rejoinder nettled the other who suddenly retorted that he would answer for twenty guns, and that both himself and men were knocked down Englishmen. Upon this, Paul said that he would allow him exactly five minutes for a sober, second thought. That brief period passed, Paul, hoisting the American colors, ran close under the other ship's stern, and engaged her. It was about eight o'clock at night that this strange quarrel was picked in the middle of the ocean. Why cannot men be peaceable on that great common? Or does nature in those fierce night brawlers, the billows, set mankind but a sorry example? After ten minutes cannonading, the stranger struck, 
shouting out that half his men were killed. The aerial's crew hurrahed. Orders were called to take possession. At this juncture, the prize shifting her position so that she headed away, and to leeward of the aerial, thrust her long spanker boom diagonally over the latter's quarter, when Israel, who was standing close by, instinctively caught hold of it. Just as he had grasped the jib boom of the Serapis. And, at the same moment, hearing the call to take possession, in the valiant excitement of the occasion, he leaped upon the spar, and made a rush for the stranger's deck, thinking, of course, that he would be immediately followed by the regular boarders. But the sails of the strange ship suddenly filled, she began to glide through the sea, her spanker boom, not having at all entangled itself, offering no hindrance. Israel, clinging midway along the boom, soon found himself divided from the aerial by a space impossible to be leaped. Meantime, suspecting foul play, Paul set every sail, but the stranger, having already the advantage, contrived to make good her escape, though perseveringly chased by the cheated conqueror. In the confusion, no I had observed our hero's spring. But, as the vessels separated more, an officer of the strange ship spying a man on the boom, and taking him for one of his own men, demanded what he did there. Clearing the signal halyards, sir, replied Israel, fumbling with the cord which happened to be dangling nearby. Well, bear a hand and come in, or you will have a bow chaser at you soon referring to the bow guns of the aerial. I, I, sir, said Israel, and in a moment he sprang to the deck, and soon found himself mixed in among some two hundred English sailors of a large letter of mark. At once he perceived that the story of half the crew being killed was a mere hoax, played off for the sake of making an escape. Orders were continually being given to pull on this and that rope, as the ship crowded all sail in flight. To these orders Israel, with the rest, promptly responded, pulling at the rigging stoutly as the best of them, though heaven knows his heart sunk deeper and deeper at every pull which thus helped once again to widen the gulf between him and home. In intervals he considered with himself what to do. Favored by the obscurity of the night and the number of the crew, and wearing much the same dress as theirs, it was very easy to pass himself off for one of them till morning but daylight would be sure to expose him, unless some cunning, plan could be hit upon. If discovered for what he was, nothing short of a prison awaited him upon the ship's arrival in port. It was a desperate case, only as desperate a remedy could serve. One thing was sure, he could not hide. Some audacious parade of himself promised the only hope. Marking that the sailors, not being of the regular navy, wore no uniform, and perceiving that his jacket was the only garment on him which bore any distinguishing batch, our adventurer took it off, and privily dropped it overboard, remaining now in his dark blue woolen shirt and blue cloth waistcoat. What the more inspirited Israel to the added step now contemplated, was the circumstance that the ship was not a Frenchman's or other foreigner, but her crew, though enemies, spoke the same language that he did. So very quietly, at last, he goes aloft into the main top, and sitting down on an old sail there, beside some eight or ten topmen, in an off-handed way asks one for tobacco. Give us a quid, lad, as he settled himself in his seat. Hello, said the strange sailor, who be you? Get out of the top. The fore and mizzen top men won't let us go into their tops and blame me if we'll let any of their gangs come here. So, away ye go. You're blind, or crazy, old boy, rejoined Israel. I'm a top mate, ain't I, lads? Appealing to the rest. There's only ten main top men belonging to our watch, if you are one, then there'll be eleven, said a second sailor. Get out of the top. This is too bad. Made is, cried Israel, to serve an old topmate this way. Come, come, you are foolish. Give us a quid. 
And, once more, with the utmost sociability, he addressed the sailor next to him. Look yet, returned the other, if you don't make away with yourself, you skulking spy from the mizzen, will drop you to deck like a jewel block. Seeing the party thus resolute, Israel, with some affected banter, descended. The reason why he had tried the scheme. And, spite of the foregoing failure, meant to repeat it. Was this. As customary in armed ships, the men were in companies allotted to particular places and functions. Therefore, to escape final detection, Israel must some way get himself recognized as belonging to some one of those bands, otherwise, as an isolated nondescript, discovery ere long would be certain, especially upon the next general muster. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.